So I'm going to get us started. My name is Erin uh, Kinnan, as I said in the chat, and I'm the Vice President for Civic Engagement at Bard College in cold upstate New York, um, as we were talking about the weather, um, better than talking about COVID. Um, uh, I am, <laughs> I am um, also uh, the lead for the Civic Engagement um, Open Society University Network um, team. Um, and the Open Society University Network, otherwise known as OSUN, because it's not a thing unless it has an acronym, and the Telwar Network, uh, which many of you are either in uh, an OSUN campus or a Telwar uh, Network campus. Um, in a partnership, we've launched this series of um, online workshops to support engaged scholars who have an interest in community university research. Um, and as we see here today, these workshops are led by leaders in the field of university civic engagement around the world. Um, and we're going to be hosting these monthly from February uh, through July of this year. Um, and uh, one of the things that we want to um, encourage people to think about is that we are also um, right now, I'll put it in the chat later, um, we have a fund for faculty and graduate students um, to support engaged research. So part of the impetus is to create a pipeline uh, for those interested in um, receiving research funds. Um, so I'll make sure to put that um, in the chat later on. Um, so we um, uh, have this um, monthly series and we are joined here today by two scholars. Um, we have, uh, I've been given permission to uh, use first names. So if that's unusual for you in our university, that's all we do. But if that's unusual for you, um, we encourage you to go ahead and uh, do that. Um, but we have uh, Swan, um, who is a professor of oral pathology and oral medicine at the School of Dentistry um, at the International Medical University in Malaysia, where she's been a faculty member since 2008. She was the founding member of the School of Dentistry at IMU, which is now 14 years old. Um, and she continues to serve as a faculty involved in teaching research and patient consultations in her specialty. Um, and she's also the Dean for Community Engagement um, providing leadership in university community engagement, um, which is, I think, what she's going to focus on today, because I don't know if those of us will really know dentistry. <laughs> um, uh, and she's focused on social innovation and uh, student transformation through community engagement. Um, and um, then we're joined by James, who is a professor of medicine and the head of the division of the medicine at the School of Medicine, the same university. He's been a faculty member since um, 2000, the pre-times as we call them. <laughs> he also serves as the infectious disease consultant um, uh, at, um, I'm afraid I'm not sure I'm going to be able to say the name of the hospital, James. Uh, yes, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's completed um, his subspecialty training in infectious disease. Um, and he, uh, his areas of interest include HIV medicine, infectious diseases, advocacy, marginalized communities, and the use of information technology in the practice of medicine. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Open Society University Network and the Telwar Network. Um, OSIN is a collaborative project between Bard College, the Central European University, and the Open Society Foundation that integrates learning and the advancement of knowledge across geographic and demographic boundaries through credit bearing and project-based collaborations in a wide range of academic and civic engagement programs. And the Telwar Network um, shares a vision of global higher education system that engages all students in their communities and encourages the exchange of ideas and collective action to change the world. Um, so we are thrilled to be able to launch this series um, and I'm going to turn the floor over to our speakers and again if you have not had the chance, please include um, the university where you are and your area um, of uh, scholarly interest. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Erin, uh, should I take it from here? You should take it from here. The floor is yours. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I'm just going to share my slide here. We'll start with the um, slideshow. So, um, gosh, we're going to start. So, uh, good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone who is uh, 
on the Zoom tonight. I, I must first say I'm so grateful for this opportunity to, to be able to share what little we do here at the uh, International Medical University here in Malaysia. And as, as the, 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 the title is suggesting that we, we're going to share some of uh, James and I who will come after me, uh, we're going to share some of the experiences that we, we have here in Malaysia. And we'll, like, uh, we'll be really grateful if everybody will do the same and uh, it, it might be a, a lesson worthwhile sharing. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to be uh, running through uh, Malaysia uh, for those of us who are not very familiar where Malaysia is and a little bit about the, uh, the IMU community engagement and what we do here. And uh, the last two parts will be uh, sharing some of the things that we learn looking backwards. So here, um, for those who are not sure where Malaysia is, if you look at this uh, map of the world, we are those two little red dots out there in the ocean. Yeah, and this is what we look like in bigger picture. So on the left, uh, the yellow bits, that's Malaysia. We have the Peninsula Malaysia, or we, we call the West Malaysia, and then the East Malaysia. And if you can see the word Kuala Lumpur, that's the capital city, and that's where our university is. As Erin has uh, mentioned earlier, so uh, I have been at the IMU since 2008, and before that, I was serving at the public institution for uh, 20 years before that. So, uh, but my, my real foray into community engagement in a more formal way is at IMU. So I'm going to go on to, to uh, very quickly introduce Malaysia. We are a population of about 32 million, and of which uh, 30 million is our Malaysian citizens and, and, and uh, a smaller portion of the rest, yeah? Now, I, I like to bid a warm welcome to everybody who is on here and who does not know Malaysia and never been before. We are so proud. I'm sure everybody would be to see the capital city with skyscrapers, as you can see at the top. This is the capital city uh, and the buildings are getting higher every day, trying to beat records. We also have the beautiful rainforest in Malaysia. There is a mountain range that runs through the, the backbone of the country, and uh, it's beautiful for, for, for resorts and for hiking. And we are also very proud of our um, very beautiful beaches and islands across Malaysia. So as I mentioned, the buildings just get taller, and now this is still in the making. It's going to be the second tallest building in the world. I can actually see, see it here from, from where I live across uh, you know, uh, the city. So with this, uh, we welcome you to Malaysia. And this is, these are people of Malaysia. As you can see here, we are made up of a very diverse race with religion. And we look, we definitely don't look Caucasian. We, yeah, it's amongst us, if you try to figure out, there are some oriental looking people here, like this lady, and some with traditional costumes, and some look like Indians. Yes, they are. So uh, this is what we are. And, uh, you know, we're very proud of our uh, multicultural society. So here, we are who we are today. And this is just a market scene where you see the myriad of things that are sold there. And it is made up of uh, from people with different cultural backgrounds coming together and do their daily business. And we live here with respective, uh, well, a reasonable amount of freedom to practice our religion, the festivities, the various indigenous groups, and also there's corporate Malaysia as well. So when we come, if you come to Malaysia, you're going to bound to see this, and we have lots and lots of, uh, well, I think to an expat, lots of holidays in Malaysia because of the various festivities. And we are who we are today because of where our forefathers came from. For example, my, I, I probably am a third generation Malaysian. So my forefathers came from China. As we all know, there was this diaspora from China, from India, and they come through to what uh, uh, was Malaya then. And then there was more indigenous groups and what we call the Bumiputra or, or the, uh, you know, the people who, who inhabited this place much earlier. 
And not forgetting too, there was also what we are, who we are, and what we practice and do today is pretty much influenced by the colonial eras as well. We were colonized much, much earlier by the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, and then we, have our, we had our independence in 1957. So we are like um, uh, 60 years old, uh, 60 years young. Yeah. So, so with that in the background, I'm just trying to introduce to you who we are dealing with when we are, who we're dealing with, who we interact with when we talk about community in Malaysia. Food binds us. So left, right, and center, east, west, north, south, there's always a, 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 a you know, uh, unimaginable amount of food and the variety of food, which we will always miss when we live, uh, you know, we stay abroad for, for quite a while. And these are also the various festivities I mentioned. Now, notwithstanding, there's also the, the, in, the, in the fabric of our society, of those fun and wonderful, beautiful things that we see, there's also the realities that uh, you know, we face. We, we just recently had our, uh, we still have our COVID pandemic. And then we are looking at also, you know, these are realities, low cost social economic groups, low cost housing, and there's homelessness. And there's also scenarios of uh, uh, institutions, non-government institutions reaching out to the elderly in the community homes, the less, dis the, the, the less disadvantaged, the special needs people. And we also have our fair share of environmental issues. And on your left, lower left here, we see uh, this is a typical scenario of the boat people or what we call the refugees. Um, and on the right, far right, we're beginning to also see a more vocal generation of Malaysians who will then voice out, speak up, step up uh, on, on their struggles. So like everywhere else, we are not without issues in our society, drugs, mental illness, suicide, which has come out to the fore in the pandemic. It, it was there, but it has just become very prominent. Uh, domestic abuse and also teenage, pre teenage pregnancy as well. So, so this is Malaysia, the left, the right, the dark and the bright. So what do we do for community engagement in Malaysia? We try to have uh, and an engagement with the community. So here in, in, at IMU, we don't usually use that word uh, community engaged scholarship. So, so whatever it's worth, the word community engagement is used to mean our collaboration or whatever we do with the community. And that also includes the, because we are in the education, the teaching, the research and service endeavors by our staff students uh, uh, with the community. So we, we endeavor to have an extension of our learning beyond the university walls. We try to provide a, a, opportunities for the students. And uh, as, as you can see, Malaysia is very diverse, very rich in its culture. The good, the bad, this is all that we have. So we inherit and embrace it. The, and, and the service that we do with the community includes service learning, as I think you, we are all familiar with this word, which, which refers to a more formal, uh, service uh, education within the curriculum. And uh, last but not least, the collaboration with community members. So here, this is that Venn diagram that I put together where the teaching, learning, the yellow, and the pink, the service, and also the research come together. And we carry out this, hopefully in a more and more integrated manner. Yeah, uh, we, we continue to learn over the years. These are the three facets of community engagement in, in the IMU where the university tries to have a relationship with the community. And, and it is, it's, a, it's a cycle which then fits back into the university to, to continue to improve the lot. How do we do it at the uni? There's always a, a governance whereby when a project is being proposed, it goes through a working committee and then the steering committee before it's being executed, implemented, evaluated, reporting, and then it goes back again, the, uh, again to the cycle. We are not perfect. We are far from perfect. We continue to learn. We've had many hiccups and we've fallen down many times and we're still trying to, to improve our lot. So here where we see uh, the little, the three branches, it's not just three. These are just examples of how within the university, there are platforms that staff and students can uh, implement 
their, their, uh, the planned projects. Notwithstanding, we are trying to ensure that more and more we are uh, having an outcome-based um, life in terms of uh, community engagement. It wasn't, uh, I'll share with you later, we've come uh, a long way, but we are still uh, you know, trying to improve uh, within that. So the next few slides is just going to running, just run through very quickly of how these years have been. This is a snapshot of a particular year, but it would be representative of how we would have done BC, before Christ, before the coronavirus, or, or as Erin put it, you know, the pre-era. the pre -era. Yeah, so we, there's this running joke as BC or after C, okay? So, so we have this uh, dental screening tree where I am also very involved in the oral health care program from the university to the community, and we continue to do that. The eye, the eye and vision health program, the diabetes education, and now we are creating a more, moving towards a more sustainable, uh, probably a 20 year cohort study in terms of diabetes. Then uh, what is worth uh, mentioning is also the immunization program for refugee children. Malaysia does not officially support or you know, assign the ratification, but uh, organizations, NGOs or universities like us, we, 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 we go out to the refugee in quite a big way. So that's one worth mentioning. And um, also, you know, we started to try to bring this into the DNA of what we are at the university in terms of environment. I wouldn't say that we have, you know, uh, done this in leaps and bounds. We're still in the infancy, but I think moving forwards when we put our mind into sustainability, it's going to be one of the things which is going to come up quite big. Then education, we, we, we refer to education as educating the public rather than the education that we give our students, which is a given that we, are, we have a very structured way of you know, formalizing and improving the teaching cycle for our, our own students. So this is referring to what we try to empower the students out there. So on a yearly basis, it would be like 1,005, 1,008 people that we reach out to. And then this is one of the flagships in the university where uh, it used to be a flagship of fundraising. We call it a cherry affair where on a yearly basis, we try to raise funds so that the charity or the work that we do will come out from this fund. So uh, that too has evolved. And I'd like to tell you that i like to inform that this has become a, a more structured student's community leadership development program with, with the aim of fundraising, but they do it from, uh, from the roots upwards, which wasn't from beginning. So uh, fast forward 2019, we, uh, I, I'm proud to say here that my colleague here, uh, James, was the first recipient of the, Mac, the prestigious McJanet Prize in 2014. And uh, in 2019, we uh, won again the McJanet Prize, second prize, and this was won by Dr. Lydia Lee. We also received a, uh, a scholarship award from the University of Texas for some work on sexual education by Dr. Farah Z Zahra. And that was the highlight for the year and the year just went on. We managed to um, uh, organize uh, the third humanitarian conference. And incidentally, this year will be our fourth humanitarian conference. Uh, we try to do it on a one in two, once in two years basis. So, so as the year continues, we continue our picking up our advocacy and also all the other things that we do best, which is healthcare, because we are a niche healthcare university. We have got a lot of programs related to healthcare. So we feel this is something we could do for the community and that's our strength. So, and uh, what's picking up as well is community engaged research in a more participatory manner. Uh, this has, uh, you know, I've been trying to push that in the last few years and it's picking up momentum. And who knew that in 2020, we had our COVID-19 pandemic and our many, many make or break moments. And I think this is something where we, we learned, we look back and we realized we actually tried to pivot. And what are the lessons that we learned? So the next two slides will be what we did in 2020. Well, the picture that we showed here is, you know, volunteerism or what you can say as blood in our hands. 
you know, as, as we could see the whole world, we appreciate that there were lots of death and we were just going out to volunteer and do the best we can, uh, donating ventilators from our university to hospitals who were really in acute need for that. Pretty much, I think many parts of the world were doing that as well. And mental health has come to the fore. Uh, we've done quite a number of, uh, we couldn't go out to the community, but we reached out virtually and we tried to have more of this awareness of people trying to seek help uh, in this area. And on your right side here, we people were just busy making, uh, you know, trying their best to make the PPEs, the protective garments. And I, I, this is one of the things that we are quite proud in community engagement. We had engaged our own community partner, a refugee community partner, and they, they volunteered uh, in their own words. They have been, we have been hosting them all these years. They felt that this was a time, although they themselves were not spared, they wanted to give back to the country. And we were very touched. They were making masks as well. Of course, we had to provide the, the, you know, the template, that sort of thing. But they were just doing it to be donated. So I think this was something that came out of it, which was, we were very proud of that. And in, in, in between, while doing, you know, trying to do the best we can, reach, sending out aids to uh, uh, communities, we had lockdown, like a few countries, as you know. So we were really reaching out for those, to, to those communities who were locked down at home. And uh, it was a, a very acute situation. Um, at the same time, we continued with our uh, reaching out through webinars in terms of our disability advocacy and our one, 1,000 days nutrition for, for mothers in underprivileged uh, uh, communities. Then, oh, I, sorry, this is something worth mentioning. In your lower right, you see the role of universities. Came September, we felt, oh, good. We have nine months. I think we have learned a lot. You know, we've done a lot. Maybe we should start looking forward and say, and, and review back what the role of universities could be in shaping a better post-COVID-19 era. Little did we know that the pandemic was going to go on, was going to, uh, you know, insist on staying for the next uh, one and a half years. So we had people from the UK and for U UCSF and uh, Singapore coming together and sharing what we felt, you know, was new enthusiasm that we could share with communities and, and in universities. Then came 2021 and we realized, right, we've come, start off with the year again with COVID and we continue to do our volunteerism out there, helping the nation, a nation's, nation, nation was calling out for communities and there weren't enough people. And here we are at some of those uh, 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 vaccination centers as well. And what has come out in this pandemic was to realize, I think it came out very much to the front that there was a lot of violence, domestic violence, mental health. This was all coming out to the fore. So we, through our empowering women uh, projects, we realized that this was something we had to bring out to the fore. The lady we see here on um, the left in that pink, pink is one of Malaysia's foremost uh, champion for women in the early 70s. And there she was again when we invited her to, to give authenticity to what we were doing. And she's now very much into women's tribunal in Malaysia. So the fight continues. I felt that this was a worthwhile fight and we continue to bring into 2022 what we started off in a more consolidated way during the pandemic. And while we were doing that, we realized that in through this pandemic, the volunteerism has taken another shape and it is a proactivity among our staff and students that in order to be more meaningful in what we do, it is not just volunteer when things happen, but creating an active citizen program. And this is one of the things that we started off in a, in a trial and error manner the year before, and we felt we had to step up. And, and this was one of the things that we did. And we continue to empower doctors, uh, medical doctors who were treating the, the refugees and displaced citizens uh, through our uh, webinars for doctors. And towards the end, oh no, 
Then came the TNLC. This was one of the highlights for 2021. And we were very uh, pleased that and honored that we received an uh, engaged scholarship from uh, you know, T T Talua's network to be able to co-organize uh, this thing for uh, people in Malaysia. And that was very eye-opening from a student's standpoint. Um, and, and I think this is something we hope someday we will be able to bring it forward. And perhaps someday we will be able to welcome all of you to Malaysia and host the, the conference here someday in the future. It is really fantastic. So uh, hope to get that opportunity. And we thought we were done for the year. But no, another, another calamity struck. We had an unprecedented floods in Malaysia in uh, December. And uh, in a big way, uh, the university had to come together because uh, for some reasons, there was some uh, you know, fatigue in, 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 in some of the government organizations. So that wasn't happening. So I think our university had stepped up and you can see in the picture, the, the aid that we had packed was airlifted and given to the uh, communities in acute need. It was unpresented and it happened in the urban uh, community in right here in the city. And the picture you see down here is in an indigenous uh, community in the one of the jungle areas in Malaysia, we call it Pahang. And, and they had reached out to us for help and we felt this, uh, they were cut off because of the floods that affected them as well. So yes, we ended the year with a, a big bang that way. And we were hoping that 2022 will be somehow different. So uh, wish us luck. So in the next couple of slides, I just want to end this, this, this little uh, talk that I mentioned, how we were looking backwards in order to be able to move forward. And we have our eyes focused on impact and sustainability. And uh, starting in end of 2018, the end of 2018, we started gathering uh, momentum in terms of uh, anchoring ourselves with the UN SDG. So 2019, we have started to, to inform the university and 2020 and 2021, we're pretty much working from home, but we have kept our eyes on this. So if you look at national agenda and what we call engaged scholarship versus our university mission, where are we? The university, uh, the, 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 the nation has um, launched a 2019 U4S, which, which means University for Society. Not that they were not doing it before, but they had officiated service learning for all the public institutions in Malaysia. Uh, so the private universities were considered the, the network. For it. So when you look at that, we compare to what we are doing, there are elements of what we are doing there already. So I think we're very familiar with what service learning is in terms of academia, the experiential learning and uh, for the community and with the community moving forward. Where IME was concerned, it was very much a voluntarism and moving forward, we are trying to do more integrative uh, participatory uh, collaboration. Community engaged scholarship, as the term is used in many universities, this is a scholarship that directly benefits the community. And we derive this through our teaching research, creativity and service. I think a lot of you here are very familiar with that. Uh, it's not a term that is a term that we don't use at the university for in terms of, of legacy. But I think that also encompasses service learning as well. And I think I just want to remind all of us when we talk about community engaged scholarship, we're actually talking of a form of democracy, democracy where there is public scholarship, community partnership. So we are reminded again where we are in the university, where we are in terms of public scholarship. Are we there? In terms of partnership, are we giving or are we working together with the community? And the public information network in terms of our university, it could be really improved. And it's very important in terms of, especially with the COVID, I think many people are not informed. Participatory research, as I mentioned, we are starting to gain momentum. It wasn't so in the past. Uh, now we're talking about a true uh, community action participatory research moving forward. And of course, there's also a civic literacy. So with that in mind, 
this is what we, 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 we are moving towards, the three arms. We are making IMU as the pulse of the community. And for that to happen, it has to be collaborative rather than a, a one-way giving like an outreach would do. So it has to be more collaborative. And we, our business is students. So I think we, we, we never fall, we, we always try to remind ourselves that transformation of students and staff being role model continues in everything that we do. And when we talk about sustainability, social innovation will have to come in because it's one of those ways where we can then address the social issue rather than looking at pockets in the community to change that little bit there. So if you look at these three arms, this is what we have achieved in 2021. Our, our programs that has gone on has become more streamlined and, and put out to the forefront so that people understand with clarity which direction we are going. And uh, this was 2021, obviously, and the various things that we do to transform the students. And social, we've come to social innovation boot camps inter, and, and social entrepreneurship. And we've had our first social innovation day, which was a success. So this will continue into the new year. So when we look back, in order to be able to look forward, I want to share a little poll that we did before the pandemic. So this is not new stuff, but I think we are not running too far away from the fact. I just want to say, when we ran a poll with uh, uh, white is IMU students, uh, turquoise is IMU staff, and black is the external community. So when we were asking us, I'm just going to highlight a few things here. There are many, some items where all three parties are in, in, concur with each other, which is, they believe that the community engagement that we do does benefit the community out there in general. But there are some things where we don't really agree all the time. For example, when we, when we ask staff whether the community engagement achievements is important in their career development, we can see that IMU staff feels it is very, very important because, for example, when they have promotion and development in the career pathway, many times it is the number of papers and the papers that they show rather than the community engagement involvement that they do. So, um, you know, people don't see eye to eye. When you look at white where students are concerned, some things they don't believe in. For example, whether... Uh, community engagement is going to influence the way they look for their jobs. In IMU, most of the response is no. Reason is because when we are healthcare professionals, it is there out there. They don't have to carve out a career for themselves and bringing everything together. But so, so this is how I interpret why this is not so. But for other universities, I bet the, 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 this scenario is different. And I uh, just want to highlight one more thing. Active role in active, being an active citizen. The students really feel they want to be something useful, someone useful in a community, which we call an active citizen. And the external community thinks there's so much, there is still a lot the university can do in training the students to be active citizens. IMU staff, obviously they believe in it, but why the numbers are not high? The reason is because at the university at the present time, it is not the most important thing. So they will have to battle with so many things, I mean, manage things on their plate. So active work in community engagement is one part of their full, fuller plate. But that is, uh, you know, we have to work on that to make that, you know, a more, more real situation. So what are the lessons? The last two slides, last three slides will be about lessons learned. We, feel, we felt that sustainability will develop through sustained engagement with the community. And working towards desired outcomes is very, very important. We, have, we didn't start off that way. We started off, I mean, IMU started off community engagement in a very organic way, which just grew. Where help was needed, we were out there to give. But we were not into building self-reliance for the community, nor empowering them. The other one is keeping those outcomes in sight is going to be the key thing now moving forward in terms of when we start off the proposal, a uh, project proposal, it must begin that way. It has to begin that way and not ad hoc. And uh, UN SDGs is going to help us to provide clarity and focus in whatever we do. That's the mantra we're going to chant every time. 
And in creating sustainability, the service is shifting from a one-way one direction like an outreach into a more participatory building together something for the community with the university. Uh, last three lessons would be the pandemic has highlighted the gaps in our healthcare access for the var various pockets of the community. Uh, public knowledge and education is to be improved. The resilience of our community is very, you know, it is questionable. And there is a role and responsibility for organizations like us to, to come in a bigger way uh, to the community, be it a national crisis or, or in other ways. And we feel that as a university, we can provide more platforms for community engagement for students, either with credits or non-formal credits. And capacity building must continue. This is something that is coming on a lot in the last three years, where we are training the people to, to, be, able, to, to, to be able to do community engagement work in a more meaningful way rather than just giving. In terms of students, we felt that we can build create opportunities for them to provide that diversity, inclusivity, and equal, e equity so that they are exposed to that from earlier on. That is going to underpin so many things that they do when they become healthcare professionals. Internships must go beyond the discipline so where, 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 students, uh, where, where students are looking at different things because they already do internships within the discipline. Leadership is more of community leadership. So capacity building must continue and we must create fellows or ambassadors out of staff or students who will then go out there to advocate the, the niche area that they do. Cultural competency is something the world is getting smaller. Uh, students must have opportunity to be more mobile in terms of communicating with different cultures within the country as well as regionally and internationally. Change making is key. Uh, students, are, they agree that they are benefiting the community, but we want them to be more proactive. They need to be able to identify issues, uh, issues and lead the change. So this is where active citizens is important. So there you go. This is my last slide where I've just shared some of the strategic transformation of the community engagement landscape so that we can move forward is needed now ever before, more than ever before, where the key words that we are looking at is sustainability, participatory between university and the greater community, change making, adaptability and agility. We have seen that we've just stepped into the unknown in the last two years and how we struggle. Resilience is important. Be future ready. We always say they want to be future ready, but now we understand future ready meaning means to be equipped for the unknown and also be realistic. So we will have, in the last two years, we've learned that the realistic vision counts so much. We no longer have, we have to really come down to earth, <laughs> to, 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 to the ground and see what is really, really doable. So there, thank you so much for, uh, uh, listening to some of the things that I'll share, and these are our context. Thanks very much, Erin. I'm going to pass it over to James. Thank you so much. James, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Right. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. After hearing uh, what Prof Ku said, uh, I don't have much to say anymore, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, right, just give me a moment. Okay, so again, good uh, morning or good evening, uh, where you may be. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, after listening to, you know, the talk, I, I feel very proud because um, uh, you, we, the IMU is divided into uh, many campuses uh, and they are physical campuses that are actually quite far from each other. So where, where uh, Swan is and where I am, uh, it's about 70 kilometers away. And I'm in another campus. So um, sometimes because of this uh, physical distance, we are not very aware of what each other are doing, um, you know, and 
so I'm, I'm feeling really, really proud uh, after hearing all that, um, the things that's going on in our main campus. I'm in a very small campus uh, in a, another state. I will show you in the map later. But as I was preparing for this talk, um, it was like going back in time to something that I was uh, actively involved in um, almost 15 years ago. So um, it's very nostalgic. Uh, I'm, I was surprised that I could still remember many of the names of the students that I see in the pictures that I have in my archive. And uh, I remember all the challenges that we face. So what I'm going to share is really like an old man's, uh, you know, uh, storytelling time of uh, you know yonder years and all that uh, because uh, after this uh, project I have moved on to um, other um, community work uh, outside the university particularly in the areas that uh, I, I'm uh, a specialist in so yeah, with the marginalized community uh, HIV uh, migrant workers and all that so uh, so yeah this is a good um, good joke to my memory um, and I hope you know I, I, I don't have um, I don't think the lessons I share is going to be very earth shattering but uh, I, I suppose for anyone here I, I do realize and it was in our uh, conversation much earlier that um, IMU is really really a very uh, young university compared to some of the universities that you are from and we probably have not achieved a lot compared to uh, many of the members of the university in the Tower Network. So, um, yes, it was not going to be earth shattering, but if you're going to start a new project, maybe these lessons might be useful. Okay, let's move on. So this picture that you see in this title slide is a tractor uh, that is pulling um, a little, you know, uh, how do you say, carriage at the back. Um, this is how we got into the village or the community that we had uh, identified back in 2006 to start uh, one of the, I would say, key uh, project of IMU, uh, which eventually, uh, you know, much to my surprise, actually, uh, we managed to get the Magnet Prize in 2013. Right? So, so at that time, it, it was not possible to uh, get into the community with your car because it's probably going to damage your suspension. The, the roads are very bad. Um, it's always uh, waterlogged and very narrow. So we had to go into the community using a tractor like this. And this tractor with the carriage was provided by um, the plantation uh, management that surrounds that community. I will show you uh, on a Google map uh, what it's like, right? So yeah, uh, so um, Prof Ku so stole my thunder by showing where your Malaysia is. So I'm not going to uh, elaborate a lot, but just to give you an idea how small we are, um, we are about, we are very proud to say we are about 450 times bigger than Singapore, but everybody knows where is Singapore, but does not know where is Malaysia. Uh, it's actually, Singapore is like south to us, and uh, north to us is Thailand. Again, everyone knows where is Thailand and uh, they may not know Malaysia. We are a bit smaller than Thailand. Um, I tried to find a similar state in the US, which is the size of Malaysia. And uh, I, uh, from Google, I found that uh, California is probably, the state of California is the size of my country. So that's perspective. As Prof, uh, Prof Kuo had said, we are multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multi-religious uh, society. So it's a huge potpourri. It's a lot of fun uh, living with a lot of people speak, speaking different languages, different culture, different food, and everything. We have about 33 million of us. Uh, that's the official number from last year's census. Our official uh, religion is Islam. And uh, the Malay language of Bahasa Malaysia is our official language. Now, I, I, I brought this up because these two are key uh, to some of the challenges that we face in um, this particular project. So again, uh, welcome to Malaysia. And 
Uh, yes, ProQuest and I really, one of our dream is to host the DNLC one day in our country. Hopefully, when we could travel freely without masks and all, uh, we would love to welcome all of you uh, to Malaysia. Just bring your sunblock and an umbrella and you'll be fine. right? So it's going to be hot or it's going to be wet, huh? but it's going to be a lot of fun. A bit of history from about IMU and IMU CAS. I think uh, Prof who um, didn't mention this, but I'll just bring it up for us. Uh, we are 30 years old this year. Uh, so three decades of being a university, again, very, very small or very young university, right? Uh, on your left is the um, McJanet Prize. Uh, I was, I'm very fortunate. I, I would like to say that I am not the winner of the prize. The university is the winner of the prize. I am merely the transporter of the prize uh, where I went to US and uh, brought back this, uh, this uh, trophy at that time. Uh, and it's still in, uh, on display in one of the shelves in our, uh, um, in our university. So we're very proud of this, uh, very unexpected, but um, very humbling and honored as well. So um, yes, as a university, we were established in 1992 as a college. And then five years later, uh, the government uh, has, uh, you know, given us the university status or we achieved the university status. And on your left, you can see um, the peninsula Malaysia and uh, the three states that are circled in orange are where the IMU campuses are located, right? The main campus where uh, Prof Ku is, is in Kuala Lumpur. Um, I am in the state of Negeri Sembilan, uh, which is the next state. So the dif distance between these two states is about uh, 70 kilometers, right? And we have two campuses in Johor, the most southernmost state of the peninsula Malaysia. After that, you get Singapore, which is the red dot here. Um, and the distance between my campus and the two campuses in, in the south is around um, 150 to 170 kilometers one way. So uh, our students are um, mainly uh, concentrated in Kuala Lumpur, but medical students, they will move as they progress in their learning, they will move from south, they will move southward from Kuala Lumpur to Negeri Sembilan to Johor. So I was uh, a senior lecturer in, in IMU at that time in Negeri Sembilan in 2006, when uh, I still remember this though, uh, I was walking into the lift one day and Professor Kandasami who was the Dean at the time. He walked into the lift with me, right? I think that that elevator ride was the longest one in my life, although it's also only two floors up because he turned to me and say, Oh, by the way, James, I have volunteered you to start a project, uh, a community engagement project for IMU in the Grisom Milan. Um, I didn't know how to respond at the time. I have no experience of doing anything remotely like related to community engagement, uh, zero <coughs> knowledge there. So I was quite stunned. And I think that was the point where I think my life took a drastic change. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was very well, going very well until then anyway. So yeah, in 2006, I was given the mandate and that was because it was um, in conjunction with IMU's 15th anniversary. And, and the university or the president thought that yes, to, to celebrate the, the anniversary, it'd be good to adopt a community. Um, and they picked the campus where I am located at. And somehow my name came out <coughs> to lead the, the project um, <clears throat> and uh, adopt this community and work with this community uh, long-term, right? So at that time, it was known as a corporate social, social responsibility, um, PSR. Uh, but our provost or late provost, uh, Professor Meling Yang, eventually changed the C to community uh, social responsibility. So it was a, he started off with a, it distinctly from IMU CARES because IMU CARES uh, started way before that in 2002. 
um, it is a highly structured entity within IMU and it has this objective to create a community of scholars and professionals uh, to serve the society, promote uh, development of our students to their true potential as competent, ethical, caring, inquiring citizens and visionary leaders. I think we have more than 50 projects now, I'm quite sure, right? Uh, so it, the IMU CAS came first. Um, 2006 is when I first started the project um, and it was a CSR project. It wasn't really part of IMU CAS. So 12 lessons, I tried to do that 10 commandments thing, but it didn't work because I couldn't find 10, I couldn't slot everything into 10. Uh, so 10 commandments were out. Um, I tried. I tried to do uh, 13 reasons why. I think some of you may have watched the series. Um, it's a very depressive one. And, but I lack one lesson, so 12 it is then. Right? So this project ran from 2006 to 2013. Um, it, it went on from there, but I'm just going to concentrate on this uh, uh, seven years huh, of the project. So the first lesson for any project, if you want to start a project, is to have a vision, right? Because without a vision, um, I don't think any project would be able to take off because the vision will provide uh, direction. So our president, uh, Tan Sri Abu Bakr, uh, Sulaiman, uh, he had this vision and he shared with us, he wanted IMU's learning to shift from the university into the community. So that was his vision. And specifically, he asked us to adopt a community for long-term service or, or long-term cooperation or collaboration for teaching learning activities and service learning, right? And it has to be mutually beneficial. So the first lesson, if you want to start a new program, is to have a vision. And this vision has to have short-term medium term and long term, what you need to achieve um, with your project. The second checklist, the thing, the second lesson we learned or I learned is to have a checklist, right? So we were tasked with this, uh, this vision from um, our president who was passed to our dean and then passed to me. And the first thing was to identify, identify a suitable community that we want to adopt for five years. We want to start off with five years. And I remember driving almost every afternoon after work to survey the many villages around our community. Um, we, you know, you saw the map just now, Negri Simbilan has got the seaside. So actually the, the beach is about 30 minutes drive from my house. And um, we identified several fishing villages. Um, we had um, other communities within the town area. And there is one community, which is this, um, we call it Orang Asli, uh, uh, or natives or aborigines. And this community is uh, called Kampong Tekil. The word Kampong means village in Malay. So, so I submitted the, you know, the, 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 the details of the different um, villages that we identified. Uh, we actually interviewed all the heads of these villages to find out what are their needs, um, how could we work together. So I compiled the report and sent it to the dean. Um, and they finally, they eventually decided on the care. I was hoping that no, no, God, please don't, don't choose uh, the care. But you know, sometimes when you pray something like that, you get the worst huh? because it's supposed to bring out the best in you. So yeah, uh, so they chose the care because this is, in my opinion, at that time, the hardest community to work with uh, compared to the other communities. Huh? But I think our, our leaders had uh, foresight. And so yeah, they chose the hardest one for us. And then we had to identify and engage with stakeholders who, are, who have a vested interest in this community. I will tell you more later. We had to find out the needs of this community. Uh, and we must make sure that the needs of this community can be delivered by the university. We, we, we know that you know, our name, International Medical University, our core, core business is just 
uh, healthcare actually. So we had to find a committee that would benefit from what we are able to give. Right? Um, we had to determine our outcomes for our students and staff, what we hope to achieve uh, for them and with them. And more importantly, to, de to determine the outcomes for the community that we want to serve uh, or, or work with. Right? Uh, everything needs money. So we had to find uh, funds for sustainability. And we want that community to be eventually integrated into our curriculum or it becomes part of our teaching learning uh, experience in the university. Oh, forgot to show you. These are all the little uh, native children that we met on my first day uh, when I, I went to the uh, village. Huh? Um, some of them I actually um, met and one of them is working in my clinic actually uh, in the hospital. I'm uh, very happy to have her there. Uh, so this is what I uh, did on Google map trying to find this village. Just let me try and orientate us. Um, this is the North-South Highway. Uh, that is the artery that connects the north of the country right down to the southern tip of the country, right? So in the Greece and Milan, this, this highway runs through the state, right? Um, this is the cave. This is the village, right? And you can see all these dark green areas are uh, uh, oil palm of oil palm plantations, right? Um, owned by uh, Saim Dabi. Um, okay, the local plantation is called Kirby. So, but the mother company is Saim Dabi. So it's a huge plantation. Now, all these areas used to be forest or jungle, right? Not forest, jungle, and. Actually, these jungles are ancestral lands of the natives, right? But over time and over the years, uh, we have development. So this highway cut through their uh, ancestral land uh, and then all palm plantations came and practically surround the community with all palm, right? So they are left with this bit of jungle here. They are still living within there. Uh, access road is very limited. It's just a gravel road and they have very limited access to healthcare. The nearest uh, health clinic is about uh, 20 kilometers away in the town of Labu, further, further along in this way. Uh, and they didn't have uh, a lot of uh, other amenities like uh, clean water, electricity. Right? At that point in time, um, when we first approached this village, there were around 400 uh, people in this, or 500 uh, uh, people in this community. And um, they, uh, half of them were children below the year, uh, the, below the age of 12. Right? And they are, um, how do you say, uh, let me just, I'm, I'm trying to close the screen, but it's not working, but it's all right. Um, okay. <laughs> Then we, we, we discovered that uh, some of the needs are healthcare needs. Huh? Uh, they don't have access to healthcare. Um, they have a large number of children in the village with a very low level of education, right? Uh, the highest they've gone is up to year three in primary school. And uh, they have health concerns such as malnutrition, that uh, head lice infestations, poor eyesight, poor dental hygiene, um, we don't know what is the status of the um, adult there, but uh, we know that uh, many of them uh, struggle with uh, substance abuse, uh, smoking, uh, teenage pregnancies, as what Prof Ku has said earlier. Alcoholism is a problem. Uh, glue sniffing is a problem there among the youths. Huh? Uh, they buy a can of glue and then they just sniff it. Um, so there are many health uh, problems, many uh, amenities problem in this village. Lesson number three, gather a um, team, right? And that's what we did. Uh, we gathered this team. Uh, here it says physician, I'm the physician. As a surgeon, there's a pediatrician, 
uh, a family medicine uh, specialist, a gynecologist, a psychiatrist, community nurses that are uh, either within the university or outside of the university. Uh, we also needed help from our corporate staff in uh, arranging logistics and planning meetings and uh, taking notes, many other things that uh, we will need their help. We, we needed their help for, and of course, I uh, will uh, IT expert because uh, we need to cut in a lot of equipments into the equipment into the village to do the work, right? So, uh, from a small core team of just the three of us at that time, uh, we grew into this team and with a shared vision, and that's the third lesson we learned. So everybody buys in on this vision and we started the work. This is probably the hardest part of the project um, where I had to go and talk to all the stakeholders and there were many in this um, project. Um, on your top left is the JACOA, which is the government uh, uh, organization or uh, entity that is um, uh, assigned uh, to take care of the well-being and uh, of the natives in the whole of Malaysia. And um, Islam being an official country, uh, a religion in our country, um, so a lot of the work of uh, Jekwa is also uh, uh, has got the Islamic flavor, I would say, right? So to to further the uh, propagation of the religion among uh, the natives as well. So us coming from a university that has a very, very Caucasian name, International Medical University, uh, triggered a lot of suspicion uh, uh, on the part of Jekwa. They thought that we were a missionary group. They thought that we are trying to convert uh, the community in, to Christianity or other religions. So we had a lot of challenges um, dealing with uh, Jekwa, but uh, through a lot of meetings, I remember sitting and waiting and waiting uh, to make appointment only to be turned away and then again and again and again. But I think the lesson is we persisted and uh, eventually met and convinced them that uh, our motives are pure. We are not out to convert anybody. We just want to work with the community that, that we have identified. Right? The other one is not that difficult. The one, the logo in the center is the Ministry of Health uh, logo, or rather the state uh, health, uh, the state, uh, uh, how do you say the state? Uh, well, the, the Ministry of Health, the state level, huh? we had, it was quite easy. The moment we got approval from Jekwa, we could easily get approval from the Ministry of Health. Um, in terms of providing us with uh, medical uh, equipment and uh, personnel and medications when we need them. Also allowing us to refer uh, the villagers who have problems or health problems uh, directly to the hospital. Right? The logo on the top, uh, the top right is that of the plantation uh, management. Uh, this was the easiest of the lot and they were so happy for us to provide the um, health uh, or, or to work with the community because essentially their plantation is surrounding the, the entire community and without their approval, nobody can leave or enter the uh, community because we'll be trespassing into the plantation, which is a bit belongs to them. So we need to get their approval, but I was quite pleasantly surprised that they were very happy to help us. They even provided with a tractor that we needed to get into the village. And they provided a lot of things, provided us with tents. Uh, they helped us to erect tents that we needed to work under. Um, they uh, helped us with quite a bit of uh, equipment. They helped to clear up the, the area because where we work uh, eventually was an area that is overgrown with uh, bush bushes and grass and all that. And each time we go, they would clear it for us bef uh, before we set up the operation. Um, you can see a much younger me in the right left there, uh, back when my hair was still black. 
<laughs> and uh, the one, the man standing next to me is the village head. His name is Turi. Um, so um, I had several meetings with him in the early stages. I remember sitting in his uh, his, his home. Is most of them uh, live in uh, wooden huts, uh, and uh, I was um, staying uh, in his home. And we talked about we talked at length about what are the problems in his community um, over tea, and uh, you know, and and then we discussed how we could uh, work with each other. The man on the left in red is his successor. His name is Noel. And um, eventually, uh, that's, a, that's a story which I will tell you a bit later. Uh, he took over as the leader in the community. So, so all these stakeholders, we had to um, engage. And thankfully, through, through persistence and a lot of patience, actually, we managed to get approval from everyone. Next, of course, come money. We needed money to run this uh, program. Right? Um, our parent company, IHH Healthcare, um, does have a substantial budget for community engagement. Um, and uh, Prof Ku didn't mention this, but I think this is one of the things that uh, IMU stands out every year in the pre-pandemic time. Uh, we used to have this annual run uh, organized by the university. Uh, it's called the Cherry Fair. And it's very, very well received by the community around the, um, in the campus where uh, people sign up to run a, not the full marathon, but uh, maybe five kilometers, 10 kilometers. And I have, I have ran in this for six to seven years. I've got a lot of medals to show for it. <laughs> but the whole idea of this Cherry Fair is to raise funds and we were very, very successful in raising funds and the funds raised uh, were channeled into the various IMU CARES project and also towards our IMU disaster fund, uh, which uh, Prof Ku had alluded to a bit earlier, how we had used the funds for COVID. And before that, uh, after that, we had the flood, even before that, we had a major flood in one of the states in up north and we had used the funds for those purposes. We had engaged with uh, large uh, organizations outside the university like Colgate, uh, who really helped us a lot in providing dental equipment and you know toothpaste, toothbrush, and um, literature uh, that we could use in the community. This is long term because they kept on working with us. Nestle and the non Dumax had worked with us for more than two years in providing nutrition support for the children. And uh, some banks had chipped in every now and then to provide some funding. So, so yeah, we got funding from various uh, sources uh, to ensure sustainability. So everything needs money. Lesson number six is to, well, jump and, uh, you know, just jump in. Uh, like I said, I had no experience running a, a project of this size. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a physician and day in, day out, I only see patients in the wards. And this was something that is totally out of my comfort zone. So eventually the team just decided we, we jump in. Uh, 28th of July, 2007, we started the first of our project in the village. Uh, it went on from 9 to 6 uh, p.m. Uh, what we did was, uh, it was uh, I still remember, it was uh, quite a noisy affair actually. We had students uh, dressing up as clowns to entertain the, the little kids that just came back from their school. Um, the school is actually located within the, the community, but very poor attendance, very, very few students. I think that's about the whole lot of them. Um, and then we did health screenings uh, for adults and children. We had uh, matches like a football match and um, all the other games where we lost terribly, but it's all right. Uh, we had dental, uh, dental. other than uh, health, we also did uh, dental screening. Right? So 2007 was when we officially launched. So it took about a year to get the project off uh, the ground. So it takes time. I think number seven is a very, very important lesson we learned is that um, we wanted people to own the project, right? 
And I think that that's the one of the key thing of every project that we work with the community. In, in, we, initially, it would be uh, a very much a university led project, but over time, the ownership should shift over and be shared by all. Right? So that's what happened with Takira as well. And this is Prof Ong. He's the director of community engagement. He has retired since then. Uh, I, you know, I have learned a lot from Prof Ong. Uh, very passionate about community work. He has gone on to start the uh, Rainbow, uh, Rainbow Service. I can't Rainbow Bridge. Sorry. After that, and uh, very active in on social media now, providing uh, food uh, uh, for the needy in the community through the his uh, new work called the Rainbow Bridge. Um, so yeah, ownership, we, what we did was, uh, yeah, the arm twisting was uh, Prof Ong's idea because it was very hard to get people to work. It was very hard to get people to volunteer. Volunteerism actually had to be forced in the beginning. <laughs> so that's, that's his, his word in one of the conferences that we had to present our work. And he says, someone asked, so how do you get your staff to, to you know, come on a Saturday or public holiday? stay and do evening work among the natives and he goes like sometimes you have to arm twist people to get something going and i, I thought that was um that was good <laughs> because uh, what we did was we integrated the work into the curriculum which means for example medical students have to take part in the takil work uh, uh, as part of their um, curriculum. Event, uh, so that's when uh, Takir was assimilated into IMU CARES. Huh? So it was in uh, 2008, I think, where um, it was a CSR project and it became part of IMU CARES. Right? I think one of the most important thing that came out of this was the, um, the project or participation in any community engagement became part of our in annual appraisal criteria. So all the, until today, is still part of the annual appraisal. So for everyone who wants to have a bonus or uh, increment the salary or promotion, or it, uh, involvement in the community engagement became, is one of the important criteria. Right? Over two years, we transferred ownership from staff or from the university to the students. So by 2008, the, the projects were run or initiated wholly by students and supported by staff. In the first year, the staff were support, was doing everything. Second year, the students were doing uh, most things supported by staff. And by the third year, the community has taken over almost 50% of the work. Right? They had taken ownership and that's very, very important. And of course, there is a shared responsibility. So every project has to evolve from a unity lab to eventually a shared uh, ownership with the community. I think this is one of the lessons, lesson eight, is one of the lessons that we have learned uh, late. Huh? Uh, like I said, I didn't have a lot of experience in running any community projects at that time. And so in the first couple of years, my focus was on trying to run the project, getting volunteers, getting funding, and getting this and that uh, to work, getting students and community to work together, talking with stakeholders, that uh, this lesson um, we had neglected quite a bit uh, until towards the middle and, and the uh, final years of the project, where we had not collected data, right? Um, in medicine, we have this saying, if it's not written, it is not done, right? And I'm, I'm so sad to say that for the first two years or so, I collected a lot of data and they're still in boxes in my office, um, but they were never analyzed. They were never you know, looked into uh, until much later, right? So we had missed a lot of opportunities in, uh, in, in, in looking at data, collecting them, analyzing them, act upon the gaps that we see in we, we maybe analyze the data and of course to publish. The idea of publishing is not to enrich our own. Of course, it will help us advance in the career as, a, as an academic, but 
I, the idea of the whole idea of publishing is so that uh, we make our work known that others may learn from it, right? I think that's that's more important. I have come to realize that a bit late in the project as well. So what we did was uh, lesson nine. At the end of the first year, we did have some data. We were wondering how come there are so few people coming to our project. I mean, we have large projects. We have lots of games, lots of gifts and stuff like that and yet very few we at the end of the first year <clears throat> we found that only about 20 percent of the community has actually attended our any of our projects and then we found that uh, most of them were women and children and we don't know where the men went off to and so we analyzed the data we we had uh, more meetings with the um with the head and we found out that the men um they were not around actually in the village in the morning because they had to work uh, and our project was in the morning so they, they definitely couldn't attend it um, the youth were staying away because they were shy they were they were uh, uh, how do you say they didn't feel good to be part of a, a project uh, that is largely you know uh, health related and we want to uh, screen them and youths being used, they are quite healthy uh, compared to the more elderly folks or the children. So they stayed away. Um, we've also found out that those who are living far off from where our center was, they just didn't want to make take the trouble to come to the center to, to, to engage with us. And we had a lot of um, unsuccessful, you know, um, uh, unsuccessful uh, attempts uh, to eradicate the uh, lice infestation is a horrible thing in that village. Uh, everybody's head has got a lot of lice and we thought we were doing a good job and then we come back the next round and there it is again and we, decide, we, we discovered that well if you don't treat the whole family you're not going to get very far right and, and that's the problem. So what we did was uh, we analyzed and then we thought okay how can we do this better so what we did was we scaled down the events. We no longer had big events. Um, we instead uh, created mobile teams, uh, five, six students per team led by a leader, either uh, uh, someone who has, a student who has been there before or one of the faculty members. And we would uh, do it in the afternoon so that the men could uh, be reached. And we tell these teams to walk to the periphery of the village and then walk back to the far end and walk back. And every house we see, we will enter and we'll say hi and would like to, you know, uh, have a chat with you, maybe do some um, uh, investigations or, or health checks. Huh? And that's what we did. Huh? And uh, it was very successful, actually, this change of strategy. Um, we, will manage, we managed to almost eradicate the, the lice problem because we were treating the whole family um, and we could get so many uh, people involved in the in the uh, health screening and also um, treating all the other uh, issues that they have. And then, of course, uh, conflict, right? It was one of those uh, things that in this project where I felt there was a this was a time where I actually felt like I just want to give up right? because it was so hard. Um, that's why I told you in Malaysia, the official religion is uh, Islam. And in this village, about 80% of them were Christians, uh, uh, Catholics, and uh, about 10% of them were Muslims or uh, Islam faith. Uh, and um, about 10% again are still practicing the animalistic uh, rituals uh, of their ancestors. So there's a huge conflict. Uh, in fact, we had uh, people who secretly came into our projects when we were doing it. Uh, they uh, took photos of us, they doctored the photos, and uh, they put crosses onto our clothes, and then they sent it up to Jaguar and claimed that, there you go, this university is uh, uh, trying to convert the religious to Christianity. So that's one of the conflict that we had. Uh, we were almost uh, banned from the village by Jekwa. Uh, the old name for Jekwa is J-E-O-A. You can see it in the top right. 
Uh, the other one was on education, where they the villagers just didn't want their children to be educated in the state sanctioned uh, institutes or, or the kindergarten there or the school there because uh, they are so fearful that their children will be converted to Islam, right? So they instead goes to go to uh, schools that are organized by Catholic churches in the nearby. There's there's a Catholic church within the within the community, but it's a bit far off from the center. Uh, they rather send the kids there. So religious conflict is a problem. Uh, remember Noel and Sturi? So there was a um, there was a conflict between the two of them, uh, and that split the village right into half because um, we had came to a point where, you know, if we had talked to Sturi, then Noel wouldn't talk to us, and if we had talked to Noel, then Sturi wouldn't talk to us. So it was very difficult. And on days where we are going for our project, uh, Sturi would just lock up the whole place and wouldn't let us enter, and then or Noel would just take the half the community away from the village for some events. And then we were left with uh, nothing to do, right? So we had to become peacemakers and get everybody together, uh, sit down and talk and try to find solutions. And eventually they, of course, uh, uh, um, got back into each other's uh, good books and, and the project could go on again. But this is one time in the whole project where I really, really wanted to give up because it was just so hard. Uh, this was in the third year of the project. The good thing about this project was when we identify new uh, challenges or new needs, we had spin-offs, right? So we knew that the children between below 12 had a lot of uh, nutrition problems. So Dr. Chia, the pediatrician, created this program uh, along with Nestle, Dumax, the, the known and uh, it's called the health and wellness program. So we had a program within a program inside this uh, project. Um, our obstetrics and gynecology uh, colleagues started this adolescent self sexual health program uh, targeting uh, teenagers uh, dealing with uh, issues of uh, sex and unwanted pregnancies. Um, a psychiatrist came in and started a new project called the Mental Health and Substance Abuse Program uh, and targeted towards the uh, more adult population that uh, have challenges with uh, substance abuse. And uh, Lillian, I still remember our manager had started this program called Gifts of Sight because many of the villagers there had a uh, visual problem, but just didn't know how, some of them are not even aware they have visual problems. Uh, they just thought it was part of growing old, but they're actually very young. And um, they just didn't know where to get um, proper glasses and all that. So this project by Lillian was one of those projects within the project where we got them to um, uh, get glasses. We worked with the uh, uh, optometrists outside the community and together uh, working with the community, <clears throat> we managed to get many of them uh, glasses and, and then they could regain their uh, I, I mean, clear, clear vision. The last pro, uh, lesson is patience, actually. Uh, because over five years, through a lot of challenges, we, we and, and a lot of reflective, uh, you know, uh, exercises, uh, identifying gap, and then looking at how we could intervene. Uh, by the end of five years, we got almost 80% of the village from just 20% four years uh, earlier. Right. And then it opened up a lot of uh, opportunities to all the various schools. Uh, IMU has got many, many schools and um, the School of Medicine, Nursing, Dentistry, Nutrition and Dietetics. Uh, now we have Cairo and so many others uh, coming together and working on a single project. And this is this provided a lot of uh, avenue for interprofessional learning. Um, I'm very, very honored to be uh, invited to write the book, uh, a chapter of the book, which was published and based on this project. So uh, edited by Norlin, right? And we had some uh, papers uh, from this project. Not many, like I said, you know, data was really not one of the top priorities for me in the early years. 
But later on, when we really dive into research, we could produce some papers uh, that were published. And the beauty about this whole project uh, was that things improved so much for the village um, in terms of amenities. The, the plantation, uh, Saim Dabi, because we go in so regularly, they decided to just upgrade the road. So they finally didn't want to take us in a tractor anymore. So they built new roads for us to go in. So at, from, from depending on uh, tractors and all that, we could actually now drive right into the village because the roads were built by the plantations. A lot. Um, each time we had a major event, the VIPs or government officials will be invited, especially from Jekwa and and uh, Sturi, the head of the village, would petition him for water, better water facilities, better electricity and all that. And we could see over time, uh, things change. They got, they got their water supply, they got the electricity to more homes within the community. So over time, things have changed. But again, patience, it took, it took about five years for any of this to be uh, evident. So where is Turkey today? We actually seized this partnership in 2014 uh, because at that point, our prime minister at that point um, started this project called uh, One Malaysia, which is, um, and part of it was to have healthcare in every district and every village. So the government, this is a government sponsored project where uh, they actually send mobile teams uh, that is from the Ministry of Health. And Turkey is one of those villages that managed, that, that were served by this initiative by the government. So in the end, we realized, okay, what we have been doing for the last five, six years uh, is now being done by the government and we feel a bit redundant. So uh, we shifted focus and we officially seized the uh, partnership with this community in terms of healthcare because the government was uh, doing what we were doing anyway. Um, then the focus moved on to education, and this was led by one of our alumnus, uh, Dr. Michael, uh, on education. So he had teams of uh, students from IMU going in very regularly to educate or to help give tuitions uh, to the children in the village. Right about the same time, in around 2012-2013, uh, we were asked by Jekwa, right? Before that, they were like our enemies. But by 2012-2013, they actually invited us and say, well, you've done a great job in Turkey. Uh, we have got another village for you to work on. And this village is called Sabir. And it's just a stone throw from uh, Turkey. Uh. Sabir has got a huge problem uh, because there were a lot of land grab. Uh, there's a quarry that is, uh, that is excavating their ancestral land. And because the quarry work, uh, a lot of dust settled into the village and the villagers had a lot of health issues like asthma attacks and um, allergies, dermatitis and, and stuff like that. So, so we were asked to start a new program or duplicate this Turkey program into Serbia. And that's what we did. Uh, we, we worked in Serbia and uh, unfortunately, yeah, like what Prof Ku said, huh, we got hit by the pandemic. Uh, I'm not sure about your country, but in our country, we had many movement control orders, which, uh, which practically restricted all of us to our homes only. We just couldn't get out at all for more than a year, a year plus. Huh? Right Now we could go everywhere because we sort of like told that we had to live with the pandemic. But before that, we were told to stay home and that ground our work but um, I'm aware that last month we had restarted the work with Turkey and Serbia uh, with the easing of the movement control uh, some of my former students are involved there now and uh, I am I think this is because the one Malaysia mobile clinic is not working so well anymore because all the healthcare workers are too busy in the hospitals uh, battling COVID. Uh, so these mobile teams from that used to go in are not doing that. And that's where we are useful again, I guess. Huh? Right. So that's my last slide. Uh, 
a bit of humble brag here, sorry. So that's my picture, a real young fella in Boston uh, getting the uh, trophy. And that's me. next to me is Pam, uh, the student leader for the project at that time. So I was asked to bring a student leader to Boston and I brought uh, Pam and she's now working in uh, East Malaysia, doing a great job there as a doctor. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, real, not a humble brag at all. Uh, you deserve. Uh, I'm a little overwhelmed, I have to say, um, with all of the amazing um, work. James, I'm wondering if you could share in the chat a link to your your book or that publication that you mentioned. Um, oh, sure. Um, yeah. It's actually available on Amazon.com. Uh, I'm not sure how much it costs, though, but. Um, it would be great just to have, I think a lot of people, um, yeah. uh, I had some people messaging me about that. And um, would it be also possible for us, mm -hmm. it, you, there's a lot of really rich material. I'm wondering if it's possible for us to also get a copy of your slides. And then for people sure. who registered for um, the session today, we could share slides with them. Cause I think um, a lot of the things you talked about and then, um, so on the, um, the, the, um, the, the uh, sort of the graphs that you created, the pathways and the different Venn diagrams I thought were very useful in terms of trying to figure out ways to, to talk about this work and to, and to start to, um, I think for the different constituencies that you were talking about, the faculty, the, the students and the community helps visualize for each group um, mm. the potential impacts. And I guess, first of all, what I, I wanted to thank you both for, for talking about this in such a way that um, you didn't come as like, this is what I was trained to do or how to do research and that you both kind of came to this. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because um, I think because there's such an emphasis in the academy on publishing um, and that that is so tied into um, uh, faculty positions um, and tenure uh, here in the US. Um, how, and, and sometimes um, what I hear from, from faculty who are interested in doing this kind of scholarship that, um, and maybe this is less so in the medical field than in other fields, um, that they're, um, isn't um, the same, it's not taken quite as seriously. And so to move into the conversation with institutions about how to, first of all, help start training graduate students so that when they are um, in faculty positions are prepared and ready to do this kind of scholarship and understand it, um, um, you know, like how, how, what does that conversation look like at your university? I mean, it, maybe it's different because there's been a sort of national call to action for public universities, but I do think that that's a, a, a conflict that occurs. So I think there's more interest than scholarship in sort of doing this kind of work. Um, and then, and then secondly, just if, for people who are in the position to be able to do this kind of scholarship, how you start to move into, um, doing community-based work if you haven't had the training or how how did you go about doing that? James, you talked about some lessons learned and some mistakes that you made. Um, and, and some of this work, it seems to me, takes a really long time. It's not something that you can do um, in, a, in a nice, you know, um, contained, I'm going to start uh, in January of 2022 and I'm going to be done by December 2022. It's, and, <laughs> and maybe that's where some of the conflict occurs because yes. of the pressure that any funding needs, we're, we're always looking at outcomes, 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 and that those outcomes need to be immediate. So I'm wondering if, if you can, you know, maybe if, if any of those aspects of um, either conversations at the university or faculty that you're having um, could help unpack that a little bit, because I know that that's what I'm hearing from um, faculty um, on, on my end. Right, maybe I'll, I'll just start first. Um... I, I, so I have already owned up from the beginning that I went in with the project with zero knowledge of community work. And it's not, it's not a little mistakes uh, that I made. I think I made a ton of mistakes. And I think this one thing good about the project uh, in Turkey was it helped us, um, it helped us to navigate future challenges. We, we, we had, um, I, I remember at, towards the end of the project, I was asked by Prof. Hong to prepare a document on uh, IMU community engagement 
framework for the next five years. And his word to me, I still remember now, I thought he should write it because he's the director of the community engagement. And he goes like, well, James, five years from now, I may not be alive, you know? So I think you should write it. So, so I, I did that. I wrote a document and uh, in it, um, highlighting the pitfalls of uh, any community project from our experience. Um, the link between universities in terms of community project in Malaysia is really lacking. And that's something we could focus on um, when we uh, move on from here because we need to learn from each other. So many of the things that we have learned in the community that we work in were by trial and error actually. So we had learned a lot of things the wrong way. We did a lot of things the wrong way. I still remember the president. Uh, this is not the only project I was involved in. I was involved in two other projects in Johor, the southern campuses, uh, working with the villages there as well, but I didn't highlight them here. I still remember the president uh, bringing me one side one day and I thought we were doing a great job. Uh, there were a lot of people. Um, everybody was happy. There was a lot of music and whatnot. And he brought me and said, James, I'd like to talk to you. And he brought me behind the hall and he says, I don't think you're achieving much. I don't think you are doing what you're supposed to do. Um, and I'm not seeing uh, my vision, right? Uh, that hit me really, really hard because uh, I thought I was doing a great job. Uh, but I guess feedback like this is very important and we need to listen. Um, to you know, to know that we are not headed in the correct direction. So we we, we did a lot of reflection. Uh, it did really hurt me quite a bit actually. I now appreciate it, of course. Um, I've grown a lot as a person, and um, so yeah. When he said that, we had to go back and and look, and that's when we first started collecting data. Actually, we didn't have anything to show for it. I think in uh, we never we. Or, or rather it didn't occur to me that you need to show outcomes uh, to show that your work is, is uh, effective. You need to show evidence, you need to publish, you need to get the word out. Uh, that wasn't part of what I, I, I would train for, I would say. Nah, um, I was a physician, I just wanted to get somebody well and go home, that's about it. I, I don't want to know what they do next, but this is a whole different ball game. Uh, we are, in for the long uh, run and we need to achieve the goals together. So that's one of the lessons I think uh, work for us here would be really to engage with the public and other private universities and see what they're doing and maybe not duplicate works, maybe we can work together and learn from each other. Yeah, I, that's, that, that's, that's my uh, take on this issue. I've shared the link on the book in the chat. I think it's a very, very good book uh, because and I don't think my uh, my chapter is great, but the other chapters were really fantastic. Uh, they're written by other McJanet Prize uh, recipients, and wow, I tell you, so amazing. Um, I sat through many, many sessions with them in, in writing the book. We didn't have Zoom and Teams at that time, so we had to actually sit down physically and talk to each other and uh, came up with the book. So each chapter contains uh, valuable lessons from each of the projects of the Venus of the McJanet Prize. Thank you. Thank you. Swan, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I thought I would just jump in here as well. I want to concur with um, what James has just shared. The same president uh, he was mentioning is also the person who sits in the management committee at the university whom I report to as well in this portfolio that I, I the non-dentistry portfolio, community engagement. So again, he, as I took over that position from uh, Prof Ong who retired, and I remember in my first, uh, first quarterly meeting for that year, and he, he, he did it publicly, James. He didn't bring me aside, okay? <laughs> So he told me, you know, this same group of people whom I'm, you know, leading, the same group of people, they have no outcomes. I've been telling them for years. So, so I, I told him, I said, um, 
Tan Sri, Tan Sri is, is akin to uh, 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 Sir, right? So I said, Sir, I've just inherited this uh, portfolio. If people have not been um, collecting data, which they haven't been, then obviously you cannot be looking for the desired outcome. So again, what James is saying is what I have experienced more publicly. It also hit me because it, it, logically when we're doing something, uh, we will be asking, what is it we want from them? But you see, the label is called outcomes. Fine. So I grew, I grew up with that. Uh, from the day I took over, Tan Sri will be insisting on, what's your outcome? What's your outcome? What's your outcome? I said, okay, I'm now leading the people from the point of pro proposal. We want to see the, out the desired outcome. Previously, it was just go in and do whatever you can. And then let's look back and see what we can gather. It shouldn't be that way. So now it, it was a, a difficult beginning two years when I took over because people were complaining. People meaning the faculty uh, who sent in the proposal, they were complaining that uh, I was insisting on outcomes. It is something very unfamiliar for them. So, so it was a difficult first, first two years for me. And then I decided, okay, with so much huff and puff, I think people will be turned off by the word outcome. So it's become a bad word. I don't use the word outcome anymore. So now when we're talking to people who, who um, okay, we don't talk to people. We tell people, don't write up the proposal. Come chat with us, just chat, chat. And that seems to be helping because we have once in two weeks uh, a cafe chat, have coffee until COVID hit us. Then it was Zoom. So we call it, uh, you know, community engagement clinic. Uh, no, no, we're just uh, chatting. So from there, they begin to feel, oh, it's a very logical thing. Outcome is not something imposed upon them from the university, but it's like, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, if have you spoken to the people, what is it they really need? And that becomes uh, how we carve out the desired outcome. And, and I, so I think that part was, uh, I, I'm still learning because when we um, created this, out, I, James, if you created that document, <laughs> I propagated that document. It didn't go out. It didn't go down well because I was I was uh, bearing the brunt where people felt now they are so structured. Now they all have to do that, and they didn't like it at all. They were saying, you know, we are. This is very important. They said we are just volunteers. You know, we are just volunteers, so don't push us. We just want to do what is beneficial for them and go home. We are not there to go and collect the data. We're not doing research. But then came this other thing when I say, if you're not collecting data, then how do you know that what you intended was going to show up? I mean, so, so it, it has to. So now the mantra is try to go from their point of view of what's logical for them. If it's logical for them, just check with the community. So I try not to use the word outcome because it brings bad, bad experiences to them. Until a time when you have a new batch of uh, staff, it, the staff to, where they hear it for the first time is fresh. I, I realize when the older ones have retired and then the new ones, when you tell the outcomes, it makes a lot of sense to them because previously they were not going on outcomes and they introduce outcomes. It's like, why can't you let me do what I used to do previously, which is just going in Saturday, come back, that sort of thing. Yeah, so I think, um, uh, um, yeah, we both uh, have to bear this cross. <laughs> So the other thing, uh, Irene, you were mentioning about the, the research. How do you get, oh, like James, I am totally uh, science-based. I see things uh, black and white. <laughs> I have never actually dabbled in community engagement, but I felt I, I leaned upon my logical sense, what would be comfortable, but I've learned on, on, on that platform. So I tell people, look, we have only two hands and we have to do so many things. Why don't you do everything in one? When you are going for promotion, they look for publication. Community engagement is compulsory in the university. 
you have to do it. I mean, you have to participate. So why don't you just also be a data collector or a proposal writer or uh, whatever you want to do? And then how do you incorporate uh, research? They don't like the word research either. Because for the, <laughs> James, I think you can, you can relate to me. The word research is like, no, but how do we have a controlled study? We're not even talking about a controlled experiment. You know what I mean? They think that, oh, if you're going to do the, the indigenous people, there are 40 of them with lies, how do we get another 40 with no lies? No, we're not talking about that at all. So I think this is probably to be blamed is because we have not dabbled so much in qualitative study. Mm -hmm. We couldn't appreciate there's so many things in between the numbers. Yeah. So that's also a yes, James. So yeah. I think this is all one mindset we've, we've, we've been having to struggle. So, uh, you know, we have to try and bring in workshops to tell, to share with them. There are many more things you can do when you talk to the people. But then again comes this other issue of, oh, we're just talking? I mean, we're just chatting? Because they, are not, they, they do not know what qualitative study is. Mm -hmm. Because a qualitative study is, is structured. But they're not familiar with that either. So again, uh, Erin, I, I wanted to say, building that capacity for people who are involving in community work, which is everybody in the university, I think all these skills are necessary. Yeah. And once they know, they'll say, oh, I can do it. As opposed to, what is it that you want? You keep on saying research, research, research. So I think over the years, we try to tell people, now if you're doing diabetes and obesity and all that, it's beyond just getting your, uh, uh, taking the blood pressure, take yeah. a few uh, blood samples, stool samples, and say goodbye to them. You publish <laughs> your paper, but they are still back to, they are still in square one. They haven't moved an inch because, so I think that also has to change. It's slowly changing. When I talk to students and say, when did this proposal come in? Have you actually spoken to the community? No, I haven't. So is this a one-way street? Is this what you want to go and sell to them? You brought along a catalog of what we can do from the university, oral health, this health, that. what is it you want? So this is very one-way street. So I've been telling the students, uh, why do students do that? It's because it's shortcut. They just have to come and ask, Prof. James, your, your community, what are they doing? Uh? Oh, lies. Okay, lies. Okay, I'm on the lies program. They haven't even spoken to the community. So they hear it from somebody and they will create something and then just bring it there. We want to run this program. This is where this problem is. But people like, uh, you know, my dear friend, James, he is actually on the ground with all the struggles that's real. And then the students don't do that. When they go there, they try to implement, they have 50% dropout rate. They just don't come anymore, prof, they don't come. It's because you haven't even built that with them. And so when we talk to them about building trust and relationship, it's such a soft, mushy, mushy thing, you know? They feel that it's like, oh, is it about saying hello and being nice to them? No. Um, I had one little foray into another indigenous group where I just asked the owner, like you, James, I said, so what is needed in your group? Do they need some kind of a healthcare or oral health? This lady was very protective. She says, no, they are not going to see you because they don't know who you are. And, and obviously, she wasn't giving me an opportunity to, to uh, be part of them. So, I mean, that was a learning lesson because the lesson says you can't just walk into a community who don't know you. So, James have actually built a relationship with the people there and the trust is there. When they see him, they know it's only good things. Whereas if we don't, like the students, I'm going to run this mental health with you. They are watching you and say, why mental health has survived so long, so well without you? <laughs> and you're bringing this mental health thing to me. So I, I've learned so much within this short period that the communication and building that trust is absolutely key to, to begin anything. So yeah. yes, I think this book is going to be uh, really useful for, for starters, 
for middle part as well as probably at the end as well. Thanks, Erin. Long answer to your two Thank short you. questions. Thank you uh, both. I really appreciate that. Before others may have to leave, I just want to remind everybody that they, we do have a call for um, applications for the, a research fund to support this kind of work, both for graduate students and for faculty. So I just wanted to remind everybody about that. Um, and then open the floor up. I know we only have a few minutes left, but um, other questions or people want to share in the chat or, or unmute to just uh, share a little bit about what their scholarship is um, uh, and other um, uh, questions or, or uh, stories you may have um, yourself. No questions. I don't think I've ever been in a faculty <laughs> workshop where there haven't been questions. It's either too late that they're going to bed or they're pushing or they're they pushing off to coffee. work, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's 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 the um uh so one of the things that um I want to conclude us with is um um we do have another series of workshops um coming up it's going to be monthly through um through July and um we are trying to create a community of practice where we're connecting um faculty and graduate students across both the OSIN network and the Telwar network um, as I mentioned earlier and um, I think what we see here today is a um, example of the kinds of um intangible um um, aspects that come into doing this kind of research um, that, that are hard to measure, um, but certainly inform our outcomes. And um, I would encourage you to, to think about that in terms of your own uh, community work and how important it is to um, integrate that community voice. And I think someone said in the opening was um, for and with community. So, um, but, you know, you do bring an expertise that is important. Um, and then also listening um, is, is really critical. So I, I pre really appreciate that um, particular um, um, reminder. Um, and then also thinking about what are the benefits for all the different communities that you're serving in these kinds of projects, the students, the faculty, the community, and the institution. Um, so each, each uh, aspect of what goes into these kinds of projects really there, there needs to be some kind of outcome or connection to each one of those um, constituents. And it's, it's interesting because that's not true, I think, for other types of research. So there's so much more to take into consideration and therefore I think sometimes um, more opportunity to make mistakes <laughs> as we were talking about, you know, lessons learned not, um, and that being mindful that the mistake isn't um, 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 harmful to community because that sort of then really um, um, means that we're not really doing the relationship building, but yet we still need to be able to make mistakes um, because, you know, so I, I, I found that, you know, it's really hard balance um, there. Um, how to integrate community voices and how we do that and how institutions open up in order to include community voices as a sort of expert voices um, is also another, I think, um, uh, topic that we're going to try to be exploring throughout the rest of our time. Leanne, you have a question? I do. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask the speakers if, because it, it seems to me that um, a lot of what communities need <clears throat> is something that governments are meant to support. And that with the, maybe with the Washington consensus or since the 1980s, so much of government services, at least in the West and I think around the world have been privatized. And I think private, maybe private universities, even private um, corporations um, are now, you know, trying to engage civic engagement because the government is sort of not maybe doing its job or I was I was wondering if you have seen over history um, in, in your own country whether whether 
privatization has led to less service and less civic engagement or are you i uh, do you see the something else that the that these um that now we're seeing you know it's not like we're coming back from a time when there was more service now there's we're coming back to have um we're gradually improving our service i ask this because in the us if you look at some statistics back in the 1950s 66 percent of Americans volunteered, and now it's down to 25% of Americans volunteer. And there's a, withdra a withdrawal from community activism or, or community engagement because our communities are kind of like breaking down in a way we're not. We're, we're mostly emphasizing the market or maybe this the state, but where is the community? And I'm just wondering <clears throat> in that big picture where you see that. I'll turn my camera off. <clears throat> uh, I, I'll have a go at that question first, James, uh, and share what little I know. Uh, Leanne, your question is uh, very interesting. Um, in Malaysia, I would imagine in the COVID, at least in the COVID, uh, we'll talk about before COVID and after COVID. Before the COVID, uh, the government gives some tax uh, allowances or exemptions for corporations, private corporations, if they do uh, CSR. So they do want to do that, whatever the motivation was to have the tax exemption. But yes, we do see people uh, trying to do that in order to get the tax exemption. In, in that event of doing that, then they become immersed in that. So I think we are not really seeing that drastic decline, as you mentioned, here in the country. Number two, during the COVID time, uh, you know, the, everything was breaking down. I mean, the, the, the hospitals were overloaded. People were in despair. So um, the, the social enterprises, the NGOs, were all coming out and trying to do their best for the people. And I think these were some, some statistics that were given to me that in our country during this pandemic, it was the social enterprises were the first people who actually stepped up and came out in a big way. So we have this uh, uh, hashtag which says, uh, kita jaga kita, which actually means in English, uh, people taking care of people. So that is like uh, this big thing that was going on during the pandemic. Um, I think that much uh, in Malaysia, uh, I, I could see the positive way that uh, it has happened. Um, I don't think there is a decline as such, but if not careful, I'm sure this will catch up with us. James, you want to share? Yeah. Uh, correct me. Yeah, yeah, we are also running out of time, but I just quick. Uh, actually, when you, when you mention it, um, we are probably your 1950s now. Uh, so... So if you are saying that, uh, I do worry about my country's future, um, if that's where we are heading. But uh, we can use your country as an example of where we should not be going. Um, the, the, the word, the mantra that Prof Ku say, kita jaga kita, actually came up during the pandemic because in many aspects, our own government has failed us. And the word kita jaga kita can probably we say we take care of ourselves right so that's that's I, I, I can see in my country now there's a, a rise of activism among the younger folks and I think that's a good sign for our country despite I know there will be challenges going on uh, but young people are now uh, well uh, taking up or, or, or really voicing out about many many things and uh, in December like Prof Ku said we were hit with a really really bad um, spell of rain non-stop rain and we had a lot of flooding everywhere and the government just failed us uh, massively and the, all the rescue work all the help actually came from the community itself I think in one way yes it's a big slap to the government but it's another way it's actually uh, amazing to see a uh, community coming together um, for one cause. So, so yeah, I do have a very uh, guarded optimism for my country 
um, I hope we will not reach where you are. I really hope not. Uh, well, I don't know. So yeah, I, I think I think I have a, a guided optimism for our country. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This has really been um, uh, really um, helpful, I think, in, in, in thinking about next steps for many of us. And I, we really appreciate all your expertise um, and your openness uh, and your vulnerability. Um, <laughs> Um, and the and your war stories, uh, you know, having to get that feedback and how you take feedback, I think is probably also a good because I imagine in these kinds of projects you're getting more inputs, <laughs> as well as outcomes. Um, so um, thank you for sharing that. And um, we will, for those of you who are here, we will. Um, uh, for those who registered, we'll share the slides um, and the recording and. Um, uh, please spread the word about the workshops, the continuing workshops, and uh, if you have any questions, Rose put her contact information in. If you have questions about the fund, um, you can reach out and we are happy to meet and discuss um, anything, any questions that you have. So thank you all for a wonderful session today. Um, and thank you for whatever time it is for anybody um, we know <laughs> comes with its challenges. Um, really, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Very inspiring and much appreciated. So uh, keep up the inspiring work for us as a good model um, to aspire to. So thank you. Thanks, thank Erin, Rose. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.